Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, a joyous day it is today. We got to do a baptism on display, one of the greatest gifts of God to His church. And I believe it is the first baptism we've been able to do during a service since prior to COVID. So it's really great to be able to do that in the midst of the church, the family of God. And please keep Caleb and his family in your prayers as they endeavor to raise him in the faith and as he grows. And it's fitting then that our gospel reading today is the conclusion of a long section in Luke that began all the way back in chapter 14 that's really talking about how the life of the church is meant to function. Jesus is teaching His disciples how they ought to live together with one another. He began His teaching by talking about the cost of discipleship. If you recall, He says, what man begins to build a tower without first considering whether or not he has enough stuff to actually finish the job? Or the image of the army of a man of 10,000 confronting the army of 20,000, if he is, knows and is well prepared, then he meets them with a treaty of peace. And now, in summary of all of that stuff, the parable of the prodigal son, all the teachings about and warnings of possessions and the love of earthly wealth, he concludes that section with this emphasis on now that you are my disciples, how then should you live with one another? What's the expectation? And why does Jesus do this? Because He knows that even after His death and resurrection, even after your baptism into the church, your problems don't magically disappear, right? The old Adam in us, as Luther describes him, is constantly striving to wrest us back to that old life that we have left behind in Jesus. And he starts out by acknowledging this reality, and he says this, it is impossible for stumbling blocks not to come. In other words, he knows that in the life of those who follow him, there's going to be trouble. It's an inevitability that sin is going to manifest itself even among the people of God, because after all, who are we? We are sinners redeemed by Jesus. So he begins this first section by talking about that, by highlighting that just because you're following me now, and even now the disciples don't fully know what that means, but even when they do, your problems don't just magically go away. Think of the common criticisms of the church. I don't go to church because the church is full of, insert here, full of hypocrites, full of judgmental people, full of some not-so-nice things I can't say here. Where do they get those ideas from? We follow Jesus, right? We've got it figured out. It's not what Jesus is teaching us here. We don't have it quite figured out. And many of the same problems that plague human beings all over the world are present here in the church. So what exactly does that mean for us? Does that mean the one we follow isn't who He says He is? Well, let's find out. This is a rejection, this teaching, of the prosperity gospel, a term you may be familiar with. The idea that if you believe in Jesus, as Joel Olstein says, you're going to have your best life now, that it's a guarantee of blessings to come, which is sort of true, but not in the way that it's meant by those who preach a prosperity gospel. And here Jesus highlights this difference because He takes a different approach for those who follow Him. Let's open our ears to the commands of the Lord of our church and have faith to obey His teaching. So first, He brings up the stumbling blocks. They're inevitable. They're going to happen. And if you've been in a church for any period of time, you know that's the truth. We're not immune to the problems of sin within ourselves and within the world. 
But he makes a distinction here regarding the self. Because when stumbling blocks arise, who's the first person you point to? Anybody but me. Right? That's the way the world talks, but not so with Jesus. The first thing he highlights is, woe to those through whom these stumbling blocks come. In other words, he's inviting you to reflect on yourself, to guard yourself in your teaching, right? He's speaking to the apostles and the 72 that he sent out, the things you say and teach. And that's more than just what occurs in the Bible class, as any family member or parent can tell you, but it is in the life of Christ as a whole. Guard against yourself. Is your teaching faithful to God's Word? Is your desire to justify yourself or to glorify and spread God's message in Jesus? Do your actions teach the same thing as your mouth and the words that come from it? That's a tough word to hear. A tall order, as we'll see, it is an impossible one. Because if the world is right, and this is the measure by which we are measured, then the indictment that the church is full of hypocrites is definitely true. But as we'll see, Jesus measures a different way. And He says this in such strong terms not to invite despair, not to frighten you away, but to turn your eyes from you and what you can do and how good you can become so that you turn and look at Him, the only one who lived the perfect life, the only one who did all of these things perfectly. He's the only one whose actions matched the words that came from His mouth. He's the only one in whatever he did and said, always glorified God rather than sought glory for himself. Who can live up to that? No, it's meant to drive us to him, to find our security, our hope, our comfort in him. That is why when we come into his home, into his presence here on Sunday mornings, The very first thing that we do is we recall our baptism. That's what the invocation is all about. It's to remind you the name that He placed upon you, that He sealed upon you, and the promises that were given out in that deed, that your sins are forgiven, that He has given you a new life, no longer dead in your sins but alive in Jesus, a child of God, an heir to His heavenly kingdom. For that is our hope. It's Him and the promises He brings. And then the very next thing is we acknowledge the elephant in the room. I, a poor, miserable sinner. This is always the first thought that came into my head when I heard that the church was full of hypocrites. So that's like the one place that I can think of where it isn't, not because we're better than everybody else, but because we admit that we're worse. I mean, the phrase, I, a poor, miserable sinner, doesn't leave a lot to grasp onto, and that's intentional. And it may sound depressing, but it's only depressing if it isn't true, and if Jesus didn't really come, but thanks be to God, He did for you. You have received those promises, and what comes at the end of this abasement, of this confession of our true nature? Always and forever, the forgiveness of God for the sake of Jesus. The amazing love that is yours in Him. So what does the life of those who follow Christ look like? Jesus continues, by highlighting one of these particular gifts, the gift of forgiveness. You have all received that gift this morning, not because your actions matched your words, 
not because you're always seeking to glorify God, but because Christ did that perfectly for you. And on the cross and His resurrection, He exchanged His righteousness for our sinfulness. Thus you stand forgiven. But Jesus continues on here in this, He's attacking almost our sense of the self, which is key into understanding the life of the disciple of Jesus. He says, pay attention to yourselves. In the Greek, this actually has more of the sense of beware, be alert to yourselves. Because for the fallen creature, the self is deceitful. The self is puffed up and prideful. The self seeks its own glory rather than that of God's. And so if you're following Jesus in this new life of faith, you don't trust the self, but you trust in Him. The self wants what it wants, and it's not always or very often what Christ wants for you. So in a world that worships the self, do whatever feels good, live your best life now, follow your heart, whatever you want to do, do it. Jesus has a different message. He says, be on guard about yourselves. Be suspicious of the self and its desires. Now, why does He do that? He does that because the self is not the source of your salvation nor your joy in this life or the life to come. It's sinful and corrupt. The self is what we refer to in our confession of sins. That's the poor, miserable part of us. So what does Jesus come to do? He comes to kill the old self and bring a new one to life. We just witnessed that this morning in baptism. According to Luther in the small catechism, what just happened to Caleb this morning is that the old Adam in him, like the old Adam in all of us, was drowned and died. And he was risen to a new life, a new creature, a child of God, claimed adopted by God Himself, a brother in Christ, an heir to the heavenly kingdom. That is what Jesus has come to do for each and every one of us, to make us new, to give us life. So the church, a gathering of disciples who are bound together by the Spirit of Christ, which you have received in your baptism, which you continually receive daily through the Word of God and through His gifts each Sunday, how then ought they behave? How should we regard one another? Well, it's meant to be a gathering of forgiving and rebuking people. Now, you might wonder why rebuking. That doesn't seem to fit with the rest of this. But we have to understand what He means by rebuke, right? Notice the words that Jesus uses in our reading today when He talks about this. He says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. Rebuke is not a means of defending yourself or justifying yourself, but an action done with regard for the love and salvation of the brother or sister in Christ. It's not something done simply because they offended you or made you upset. Maybe the thing that they said was from God's Word, and it's not them you're upset with, but it's God's Word. It doesn't call for rebuke. But when you see a brother or sister in Christ doing something that is self-harming, that harms their faith in Christ, that seeks to draw them away from this joyous truth that they are His in the love and grace of Jesus, we speak up in love. We want them to be reminded as we are to look to Christ, not to ourselves or anything else in this world. And we're brought to repentance. And as we said earlier, the the result, the response from God for repentance is always forgiveness. And what Jesus is calling us to do is behave in the same way towards those in the body of Christ. He even gives the example, if he sins against you seven times in a day, 
If he turns and says, I repent, you must forgive them. That image always conjures up in my mind the image of the unforgiving servant who's forgiven an unbelievably massive debt. He has no hope of returning at any point ever and then chokes out his fellow servant and throws him in jail for a hundred denarii. The disciples of God are called to a different kind of life a life of forgiveness and grace in recognition of the forgiveness and grace that we have received. And so if you have a brother or sister in Christ who's disappeared from the church, we encourage and invite them to come back, a rebuke in and of itself. Not a harsh word, but a call to behave as God calls them to behave for their own benefit. You should come back to church. This is where the gifts of God, this new life you have in Christ, are to be found. Or maybe they don't attend a Bible class, or they're not in the Word very often. Encourage them to do so, for that is where they receive the Holy Spirit, where their new life in Christ is sustained and nourished. Those are rebukes because when you say things like that, What's the foremost in your mind other than the well-being of the brother or sister in Christ? You want them to be connected to the same joy and receive the same gifts to which you cling to so strongly. The root of faith that repents and forgives is Jesus. Again, we're confronted with the reality that in and of ourselves we cannot do this. It's too high of a call. It's too difficult a task. No wonder after this section, what is the response from the apostles? They say, increase our faith, Lord. We can't do this. And here we get a great encouragement from our Lord, that He's given them the faith and will give them the faith to accomplish the tasks for which He sends them. Now, this next, these next two sayings are directed at the apostles specifically, because they, the, Luke is very intent about telling us the audience of whom Jesus is speaking to. So, the first couple He's addressing to all of the disciples following Him, and now the apostles speak out, and He says this directly to the twelve. And when Luke uses the term apostle, He's referring to the twelve. So they say, increase our faith. They got it. They got the message. They got it that Jesus has asked them to do something they can't do. And what is the image that Jesus uses for their faith? He uses the image of a mustard seed. If you've ever gotten a little container of mustard seed for your cooking or seen one, they're extremely small. And the reason that He uses this image is that the faith given to you now represents the hidden kingdom of God that is fully manifested in Jesus. That's what's been given to you. But the world and you yourself don't often recognize it for what it is because it seems so insignificant. Yet, when it fully grows, it's a great tree. And so what does Jesus mean by this when He speaks these words to His disciples? He's encouraging them Right, because they still kind of don't get it. They're thinking of faith as this quantitative thing about how, how devoted they are to Jesus. And He's directing them to the object of their faith, Him. The strength of your faith does not rely on how strongly you cling to it. The strength of your faith relies on that which you have faith in, namely the Son of God, Jesus Christ. So despite the fact that their faith doesn't appear mighty, nor do we often feel that way about our own faith, God is able to work mightily through it, for its glory is yet to be manifested when His kingdom comes. Therefore, Jesus is encouraging His disciples, His apostles, that they will be given the faith necessary to do that for which He sends them. And if you know any of the exploits of the apostles, God used them mightily to grow the church. He uses you in the same way 
Often you feel inadequate in the tasks that He's given you, whether it's the job that you work or motherhood, fatherhood, or just being a good Christian. Often bring up feelings of failure and despair and drive us back to Christ Jesus. The last thing is kind of a confusing thing, especially to our modern Western ears. The last section regarding, uh, we translate in English as servants, but the Greek word there is actually slave. And again, he's talking specifically to the apostles. And the reason that he's doing this, he's emphasizing that what he's called them to is not a life of glory, not a life of glory for themselves, but a life of humility a life that points to Jesus, not only in the words they say, but in the way they live. So you can recall when we talked about the sending out of the 72, and they went out, and they started casting out demons in the name of Jesus, and they came back to Jesus, and they were like, this is amazing. I can do all this incredible stuff. And Jesus is like, whoa, 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 hold on. You shouldn't be rejoicing in the power that you've been given through the Holy Spirit, but rather in those who come to faith in me. In other words, I didn't send you out to glorify yourself so you could be puffed up in what you can now do, but rather I sent you out so that you can bear witness to me. And so again, he reminds his apostles, he uses the image of plowing and shepherding and waiting tables. Those are not things that the glorious people of the world do. Those are humble tasks, and they're often used in the Scriptures to describe the ministry of pastors and apostles. So the apostle is called to not look down on these tasks, but to accept them graciously as a command from their Lord, nor are they to do them to seek the commendation of the Father or the glory of themselves, but only seek the glory of the Father as Christ put in his example in his life. So the apostle doesn't do things for their own glory, but for the glory of Jesus. This is often called the cruciform life. And again, we come back to the self. The world says, follow the self, do what the self wants. Live your best life according to your own will and desires. But Jesus says, deny yourself. In fact, He's come to put that self to death and create a new self, a new self that follows Him, that worships Him, that glorifies Him in all the tasks that He gives. This cruciform life, while He's speaking specifically to the apostles at the end of our gospel reading, applies to the whole church, that our life is reflected in Christ. Christ, the greatest human who ever lived and walked upon the earth, suffered mightily at the hands of His sinful creation. This is why we don't preach the prosperity gospel, for Christ promises that those who follow Him will suffer in many of the same ways He did. So be on guard against the self, He says here. But you'll notice that even though there's this tone of suspicion of self, there's not a despair or a downcast, downtrodden attitude or behavior. In fact, there is one of joy and freedom. It turns out you and I were made to serve Christ, made to obey Him, to follow His commands, to worship Him. It is for freedom Christ has set us free, the Bible teaches. And so He calls us to that life. It turns out that the freedom that Jesus calls us to is not quite what we think freedom is in the world. It's the freedom to live as He intended us to from the beginning, in love and service to God. So what does this all mean? Well, it means that the church is the place where the sinful self who leads you to ultimate destruction is continually destroyed, a daily baptism into your new life, nourished as repentant sinners who receive the forgiveness they need from God. 
It is where we live under grace and not under the law. It is where faith is granted in the Most High God. It is where we serve and He is glorified. Thanks be to God for such a place, a place of rest and respite from all of the enslaving desires of this world. If it were not so, we would be hopeless. We would live under the law. We would be enslaved to our old sinful self. We would be bound to the measurement of whether or not we could perfectly live as God commands. And yet we're not. Here we are in the house of God, imperfect sinners, receiving forgiveness, life, and salvation through the grace and work of Jesus. And now in grateful faith, whether it be time, money, or talents, we simply do our best to do as He commands. And when we fail and struggle, as He knows we will, we come before Him in repentance. He forgives us every time and we go forth to serve. So, dear friends in Christ, fellow disciples of Jesus, go forth glorifying Him so that others may receive the same joy that you have in the grace of Jesus. In His name, amen.